Now, we've said the book of Revelation has 22 chapters, <clears throat> but um, by the end of chapter 14, we have seen the major part of the action in the story um, that it is telling. So by chapter 14, you know, it's pretty much done. Through a series of visions, God, through Jesus, reveals to John what will be the outcome of the struggle between Rome and the church. I mean, I, I've tried to squeeze that down to the, the shortest sentence possible you know, to explain. If someone said, well, what's the book of Revelation about? Your answer, if you could compress it down, would be through a series of visions, God through Jesus, through John, explains, reveals the outcome of the present struggle between Rome and the church in the first century. So in the visions we've seen so far, Jesus speaks to the churches, uh, then He displays His various power to defeat the enemy. Remember the parade idea, the powers parade. And then there's a discussion, a preview actually is a better word, a preview of the way the struggle will take place. You, know, you see that a preview in the movies. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I close my eyes. I don't want to see anything. If it's a movie I'm going to see, I don't want to see the previews because they give everything away. Well, there's a preview in here, you know, in the book of Revelation. It gives a preview of how the struggle is going to go. You know, the, the church will begin quickly. Satan will try to crush it temporarily. The church will survive nevertheless and will continue to grow. And then in the end, Satan and his servants will be defeated. That's kind of the flow of the action. Uh, we've also seen Satan's attacks against the Messiah, against the throne of grace itself, against God's people. And last week we were introduced to Satan's allies, the beast, right? Described in various ways, representing Rome, and the false prophet, which we saw refer to the emperor worship that was imposed on the citizens of that era. And then we looked at God's final judgment of both the faithful and the unfaithful. So this time we're going to go into a little more detail about God's dealings with Satan and the 144,000. In chapter 15, after announcing the ultimate victory in the future for the Christians, for the church, John goes back to describing the ongoing struggle and God's attack on Satan himself. And so in chapter 15, the final set of woes that will be unleashed on Rome are revealed, as well as a vision of the victorious martyrs in heaven. So let's go to chapter 15. And so it says, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. So John sees more of God's power being paraded, the final destructive power that God will use. Keep reading, verse two. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God and the song of the Lamb saying, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And so the sea of glass that he talks about, the sea of glass and fire, is a cosmic reference to evil. The place where the dragon dwells, a place where the saints must cross in order to reach heavenly uh, their heavenly reward, if you wish, the gauntlet, part of the gauntlet that they have to pass. The saints have survived the evil, you know, the sea of glass and fire, that's the evil. The saints have survived that and they've made it to the other side and are now singing the praises to God um, in heaven. Now I said the book of Revelation is about Christ, but it's also about Christ 
and his people. You know, uh, remember I told you once, many times the Bible will talk about the same thing in a variety of ways, but they're always talking about the same thing. And so when we talk about God's people in the book of Revelation, uh, he refers to them as the seven churches. Then he refers to them as the 144,000. Then he refers to them as the temple you know, that is carefully measured. Always God's people. The woman, the woman represents you know, the church and giving birth to, the, uh, to, to, uh, to Christians. The children of the seed, again, God's people. The ones who are clothed in white, the multitude. All of these references, always talking about God's people. So all of these refers to Christians and uh, the book constantly speaks of their plight and salvation and their future as well as the impending doom awaiting Satan and his servants, and in this particular book, specifically the servant called Rome. So let's keep reading. Verse five, it says, After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in the heaven was open, and the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. All right, so now, now that he's finished describing the victory of the saints and their place in heaven, he goes back to describe how God will destroy the enemy. So look at the symbols now that he's talking about. Remember we said the sea of glass, you know? Again, cosmic symbol of evil. The temple of tabernacle. Well, you know, we know that from the, uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Holy of Holies, but not the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. This is the holy place in heaven, the source of judgment, the source of power. The seven angels and plagues and bowls. Remember our study of numerology, number seven. So that's the complete destruction of the enemy and, the, and those who are impenitent. Seven bowls, seven plagues, seven this, seven that. It means it's going to be a complete wipeout. The dress of the angels, John talks about how they're dressed, similar to the priests in the Old Testament. Servants of God on behalf of the people. The priests in the Old Testament were servants of God on behalf of the people. Well, the angels in heaven are also servants of God on behalf of the people, ministering spirits. Um, the seven golden bowls, I think I've, I've missed one here, okay. Seven golden bowls, uh, those were golden vessels indicating service to God. You know, the implements in the temple were made out of gold. Why? Well, because it was the most precious metal and the most precious metal was used in the service of God in the temple. So in heaven, the imagery, the same idea, the bowls are made out of gold. When he talks about forever, that's how long his wrath will be on the wicked. You know, there's no, there's no uh, uh, purgatory, you know, part-time punishment. You know, you'll do purgatory, part-time punishment. That's not a biblical uh, concept. The punishment on the wicked will be forever. The smoke in the temple refers to God's presence. The pillar of smoke, right? In the Old Testament, same idea. Remember the imagery. That this is why a Roman pagan could not understand what was going on here. You had to be a Jew and you had to understand the symbolism. And of course, the idea that none were able to enter into the temple, into the heaven, nobody could get in. The idea there is that God's judgment is set. There's no changing, no more opportunity for mediation. When the priest was in the temple, he was, the, you know, he was acting as mediator. There was mediation going on and Jesus on the mediation going on. But when the judgment comes, no more mediation. It's closed. No more bargaining, okay? So we get to chapter 16. Judgment was announced before, 
chapter six, you know, the sixth seal, and it was paraded, the judgment and the power was paraded, the seven trumpets, but now the vision shows the final judgment to be carried out and what will be the results when it finally happens. Remember, we had the parade, we had a preview of the bad things that were going to happen to the wicked, but now they're actually happening. So the trumpets were a kind of a warning for men to repent. That's why only a third of the earth was destroyed that John mentions. Now, without repentance, the bowls will be emptied and this time everyone will be destroyed. In other words, the final judgment. No more warnings, judgment has already come. And so the appearance of Christianity, the preaching of the gospel, the reaction of Christians while they were in persecution or under persecution in the empire, all of these things combined with the natural problems that Rome was suffering provided a witness and an encouragement for them to turn to God. Remember, the idea wasn't just to just wipe them out. The idea was to punish them so that they would turn to God, just like the Jews. Many times they were punished. They turned to God. The Ninevites, right, were told that a great punishment was coming upon them. And what happened? They turned. They were a wicked city, but they turned to God in repentance. So the same thing is here. You know, there's time for you. But John, in his description, eventually shows that that time is going to run out. Eventually, you know, the heavens will be closed. No more time. So history shows that they, they didn't repent. Okay? Constantine, the first Roman emperor, was uh, converted in 312 on the eve of battle, and he established toleration of Christianity throughout the empire. The first emperor converted, right? He wasn't the first emperor, the first one converted. But we find out from history that this was too little and too late to avoid the judgment on the empire and its final fall in 410 AD. Now, Rome continued as a political force for a while longer, but it was soon displaced by other nations as a world power. It wasn't a world power after that time. And ultimately it became the, um, the center for Roman Catholicism in the seventh century. And then later on the Italian Renaissance somewhere around the 15th century. But when John was speaking, Rome dominated the world and was officially seeking to destroy the church. And for this, God announces that it will be defeated and destroyed. Now you have to understand, historically, complete destruction you know, doesn't mean that every building was burnt down to the ground, every person killed. You know, complete destruction didn't refer to you know, turning the place into rubble, but rather that it would lose its dominance, it would be defeated, and it would never again regain its status. I mean, think today, Italy, right? What is its status? Well, it's the third largest economy in Europe, behind Germany and France. Then comes Italy as a, an economy, and that's just Europe. Japan has a bigger economy than, uh, than Italy. Militarily, it is, I mean, it's, you know, there's nothing there. You know, they, they don't have, they're not strong militarily. And I, I'm not insulting Italians. You know, my, my family's Italian. I'm just saying they fell from power and dominance and when they fell, they never regained it and have not to this day. So let's go to verse one. It says, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the voice from the temple, of course, who else's voice is that? That's God's voice. He's the only one in the temple. God is now pronouncing judgment. And so we look at the first bowl, verse two. It says, so the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshiped his image. So we have land destruction punishment of the wicked specifically. Uh, and, and notice, no overlap to Christians. 
The punishment was for the wicked. Verse three, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. And so we have maritime destruction. Verse four to seven, it says, then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of waters and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink, they deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, yes, O Lord God, the almighty, true and righteous are your are your judgment. So the third bull, land and water destruction. So the image here is that the enemy has made the martyrs drink the cup of wrath and now the enemy will drink dest destruction as well. You made us drink the cup of wrath, persecution, now we're going to make, God is going to make you drink the cup of wrath and persecution. And all of this as a response to the prayers of the saints. Keep going, verses eight and nine. It says, the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and it was given it to scorch men with fire and men were scorched with fierce heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues and they did not repent so as to give him glory. And so the destruction of the normal functioning of the heavenly bodies. Remember now, we, we, we talked about this you know, when we were talking about apocalyptic literature, right? You know, the stars falling down, the rivers full of blood. You know? If somebody goes through a history book and say, well, wait a minute, I don't remember any river in Italy that had blood in it. You know, remember here, it's signifying destruction and judgment, the collapse of an empire, and it describes it in you know, terms, heavenly, heavenly bodies are falling down, stars, the, the, the waters filled with blood, okay? A very powerful imagery to demonstrate a powerful thing that is going to take place. Now notice that these first four bowls parallel the first four trumpets, but now, but simply are intensified. Also, not even the bowls of wrath could motivate these evil men to repent. And so this gives justification for God's judgment. Should, did He judge too quickly? You know, someone said, did He judge? Should He have given them more time, so on and so forth? So the very fact that the, the, the nation, the empire, did not repent in any way justifies God's just, uh, judgment of them. Okay, the fifth bowl. It says, then the fifth angel poured out, poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they uh, do not repent of their, of their deeds. So a complete collapse due to internal decay and evil. The throne of the beast and his power source is affected. Now this does not turn uh, these people towards God, but rather it intensifies his blasphemy and his evil deeds. The worse they're persecuted, the worse they're judged, the worse they are. Instead of saying, please God, stop. You know, we, what do I have to do to make you stop? No, they're shaking their fist at heaven. And so we go to the sixth bowl, verses 12 to 16. It says, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the king of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har-Mageddon. And so the sixth bowl announces the complete destruction by invading armies. The Euphrates River, of course, is the land of the enemies of the empire. It's the furthest point. The idea that the river is dried up suggested that 
there is nothing between the enemies of Rome and the seat of power, not even the most northern natural barrier, which was the Euphrates River, not even the waters protecting you now because the water is dried up. The way is clear for the enemies to enter the land. Again, you go to the history books and say, well, where, where does it show you know, geographically that there was no water in the Euphrates? You're, you're barking up the wrong tree. The imagery is suggesting or describing that the empire, empire is becoming defenseless. Even its natural defenses are abandoning them. Historically, the Parthians, who were from the region of Viran, ultimately invaded Rome. But at this point, John takes another break and he explains how Satan and Rome are not going to go down without a fight. And he tells us what they do. He says, out of their mouths come three unclean spirits. Well, who are the three? One is Satan, you know, the dragon, the other one's the beast, Rome, and the other one, the false prophet, you know, uh, emperor worship. So out of these three, he says, uh, come unclean spirits, frogs. Since there is an army under God's direction coming to battle with them, Satan and the beast will also marshal forces to meet them. They're not giving up. And so the unclean spirits are possibly evil propaganda and alliances that Rome will form in order to defend itself. And it did. It, it didn't do that in the past. But now it makes alliances with different nations to try to protect itself. Many of whom historically turned against them in the end. In the end, the ones they made alliances with double-crossed them. And they joined with the others to come in and, you know, and to overrun the, uh, the city. So they complete their deceptions in organizing a defensive force and are ready for battle as they gather at a place called Har Megeddon. Now we don't see the battle yet, but we'll get the results of the battle in chapter 19. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Har Megeddon, okay? Historically, we know that as the empire grew weak, it became vulnerable to outside attack, which occurred as the Goths and the Vist Goths, hard to say that, and the, bar, uh, the barbarians began to overrun the city in the third and the fourth centuries. So this is the vision of this final defeat. So John is looking ahead and, and giving prophecy that will take place in the not too distant future and gives you know, some rather detailed descriptions of what's going to happen. Now he mentions Armageddon here, literally Mount of Megiddo, a real place. It was a city of the Manassites in the great plain of the tribe of Issachar. If you wanted to find it geographically, uh, and I've been there, I've seen it, you know, there's not, not much to it. Um, 75 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Now in the Old Testament, this particular place was a strategic military fortress of Solomon. It was a place where a lot of great battles were won and lost. Gideon and Deborah and Saul and Jonathan and uh, Ahaziah and uh, Josiah, all battles in this region, in this place. So in the Hebrew mind, it was a place of significant military history. Today, it would be like, you know, he met his Waterloo. For a, Jew is, for a Jew, it would have been he met his Harmageddon. Or remember the Alamo. If you were a Jew, remember Harmageddon or um, at Gettysburg, right? We associate those places with military battles. So for the Jews, it was a symbol of struggle. It was a symbol of defeat, of battles of epic proportions, all right? To the point that Satan is not going down without a fight. And so you know, John mentions this Armageddon, where wars have been won and mostly lost. So he will gather his, mentioning Satan now, 
he'll gather his forces and he'll wage an all out war in resistance to God's judgment. And John is saying, it'll be like the Alamo, it'll be like Iwo Jima, it'll be like Dunkirk or the Battle of Britain or the Berlin Wall or whatever, you know, whatever imagery you want. That's what he's getting across here. It'll be you know, the mother of all battles. So Armageddon or Megiddo, or as we say today, Armageddon, all in one word, is a place that symbolizes struggle resistance against God's judgment. Okay? So the chapter begins with God's final judgment being carried out as the bowls of wrath are being poured out. This scene is interrupted as Satan and the beast respond by gathering its forces for battle and resistance against this judgment. So they're being pounded away. You know, the big picture, you know, the big guns are being pounded and pounded and pounded, you know, the bad guys are being pounded, and then all of a sudden the scene switches over to the, the enemy camp. And John reveals what's going on in the enemy camp, the ones who are getting pounded. And he says, you know, the, the, the beast and the dragon, and we, we've got reinforcements, we're going to make alliances, we're going to create a defense. And so with the trumpets, or excuse me, when the trumpets were sounded in chapter nine, the sixth trumpet announced a series of wars and battles. But now under the sixth bowl, it is the war, it is the final battle, it is the mother of all battles. So from a, now I, we're going to just hold that for a second. You know, we've had to do that a lot in this class. You know, hold that thought for a second. We're going to open another file here, OK? Because I need to open another file to be able to talk about this thing over here. From a secondary prophecy perspective, this would refer to Rome's final defeat where she would no longer rise to prominence or world power. Remember I told you about the various types of prophecy? Okay. There was immediate prophecy, something's going to happen right away. There was uh, ongoing prophecy, something a little further into the future. And then there was eschatological uh, prophecy, you know, the end time, the final judgment. And sometimes a passage, you, know, you have to figure out, is this immediate, is this ongoing, is this of the end? So remembering that, let me say this again from a secondary prophecy perspective. In other words, this ongoing thing, all right, not in the too distant, too distant future. What John is talking about here, the bulls, the wrath, the destruction, would refer to Rome's final defeat where she would no longer rise to prominence. From an ongoing prophecy perspective, it refers to any ungodly nation or entity that resists God's call or judgment the final result will always be defeat. That's the ongoing prophecy. Uh, who, who, uh, who would figure in that type of thing? Well, all of those who rose up to try to dominate the world through the power of evil. Uh, some would say Napoleon, you know, depends if you speak French or not. You know, uh, Hitler, absolutely, you know, in, in our era. Hitler, absolutely. Uh, during the Second World War, a lot of people thought he was the Antichrist. Uh, the USSR, uh, now we have you know, global you know, jihadist terrorists. So the ongoing prophecy here is that no matter when something, someone, some idea rises up to try to exalt evil, to try to give power to Satan, it will be defeated. And then from a eschatological perspective, meaning the same words, the same prophecy, fulfilled at the end, says that at the end of time, Jesus will come and finally put an end to all of it. And the final uh, enemy to be defeated will not be an idea or a nation or a man, it'll be death itself. Death itself. All these, all these people are purveyors of death through the power of evil. And they're all defeated one after another, first Rome and all the others. The final victory will be when the Lord comes to defeat death itself. And once death is defeated, 
evil has no power anymore in any way, shape, or form. So now, so okay, so we'll close that window and we'll go back to our, what we're talking about. So now that he's explained Satan's reaction to God's final judgment represented by the bowls, John is going to describe the final bowl. So let's go to verse 17. It says, then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air. Notice, not, not, not on the earth now. He poured it out in the air. That's significant. And a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. Now the same voice that uh, announced the judgment also announces its completion. The bowl is poured out in the air. Why? Because Satan is the ruler of the powers and principalities of what place? The air. Ephesians 2 verse 3. The judgment here is on Satan himself. The final judgment on Rome, despite its resistance symbolized by Armageddon, the final judgment on Satan as the final bowl is poured out in the air where he is. Verse 18, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake, uh, earthquake was it and so mighty. So the natural disasters always refer to the passing of a nation. The greater the, the disaster, the greater the nation. So the greatest earthquakes ever paralleled, excuse me, let me say that again. The greatest earthquake ever parallels the passing of the greatest empire ever, which was Rome. Rome was the greatest and longest lasting empire. Not just empire, world empire. There's never been another world empire since Rome. The Bible says there never will be ever again. Verse 19, 20. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath and every island fled away and the mountains were not found. So he reveals that the beast is a city and the city's symbolic name is Babylon. Now in the next chapter he's going to give more details as to who this Babylon really is. The fact that it's split up into three demonstrates its utter destruction. The nations and the islands are its allies who are also destroyed. Okay? Now this is no coincidence. All these military and natural calamities are the way God is judging or making Rome drink the cup. That's the cup of wrath. That's what he's describing. So verse 21, last verse and huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. Again, you're going into history books. Well, I don't remember ever reading about 100. How big is a 100 pound hailstone? You know what I mean? Would it naturally you know, break up before it hit the atmosphere? You know, remember now, symbol, I keep coming back to it because there's so many teachers, you know what I mean, that try to sync everything up with you know, history. Symbolism, symbolism. The hailstones show that it wasn't just a destruction of the government, it wasn't just pinpoint destruction. We're going to take out the uh, emperor, we're going to take out his cabinet, we're going to take out the generals, we're going to you know, pinpoint destruction. No, 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 no. These were not drone strikes. Hundred pound hailstones. Does anybody survive that? It's like trying to walk between the raindrops, right? You can't do it. And so the, the idea here is that the judgment uh, affects the entire nation. The entire nation suffered defeat and punishment in the judgment, not just the leaders. Again, as justification of God's acts, the people curse God despite their judgment. They're defeated, they're destroyed, but they're not annihilated. 
the culture survives, but they do not survive as believers. Their power is taken away, but they keep their culture. And what's left of Rome? Tourist attractions. Tourist attractions. That's all that's left. And, and, and a lot of their money comes from tourist attractions. Israel, on the other hand, when it was punished, it repented and it returned to God. But it didn't, you know, <laughs> but it didn't fulfill its ultimate goal, did it? And we know that. All right, so we're going to stop there in our next lesson. John is going to be describing in more detail the beast, the Roman Empire, but using the imagery of a harlot. So we switch around again. Sometimes it's a dragon, now it's going to be a harlot. And uh, you, you, you kind of are able to stay in the zone if you remember lots of different descriptions for the same thing. It's always the same story, always the same story, and it's all happened. All right, thank you very much for your attention. We'll keep on going next time. Only a couple of lessons left.